Cue number one. So we all know about how Hitler and the rest of the Nazis came to hijack the Weimar Republic through democratic means. But what is lesser known was a time that they tried and failed to straight up coup the Weimar government. So immediately post World War I Germany was not a very fun place, and extremist parties began to exploit this chaos. In October 1923, in Saxony and Thuringia, the communists joined with the local social democrats to take power in those state governments, with the intention of carrying out a seizure of power in the Weimar Republic. And in Bavaria, where a coup seemed imminent, the state government openly defied orders from Berlin. The Bavarian-Berlin conflict, however, reached a boiling point when Gustav Stresemann, the then German Chancellor, gave up the passive resistance to the Ruhr occupation, a move which was heavily opposed by those in Bavaria. The Prime Minister of Bavaria, Eugene von Nilling, in response appointed a guy named Gustav Ritter von Kahr as Commissioner of Bavaria, with basically dictatorial powers. Kahr and Nilling began to collaborate with a bunch of far-right-wing groups, which those in Berlin rightfully began to worry about, and kindly asked them to stop. Carr, in a move to appease the Berlin authorities, decided to send in the army to bring down a certain violent right-wing extremist group, the Nazis. Hitler, getting wind of this, contacted Erich Ludendorff, who was a former World War I general and was involved in an earlier failed coup in 1920. Together they gathered hundreds of armed brown shirts and marched on the Burger Brockeller, or beer cellar in English, where leaders of the Bavarian government were meeting and seized most of the Bavarian leaders. In a big dramatic show, they forced them to support Hitler and call for a march on Berlin in vain of Mussolini's march on Rome. But immediately upon release, they denounced Hitler and, well, the entire thing began to unravel. Before the Nazis even managed to get to Munich city square, they came under fire and scattered. Hitler got shot in the arm and fled into hiding, but was found and arrested two days later. But in a way, Hitler kind of looked out because the courts that tried him were very sympathetic to his cause, and he only ended up serving nine months in jail, where he ended up writing a certain book. Cue number two. So before the US did the whole Operation Iraqi Freedom thing under Bush, Bill Clinton had taken a shot at overthrowing Saddam. In early 1996, US President Bill Clinton commissioned a reportedly $100 million attempt to oust the Iraqi president through collaborative efforts by the CIA, British intelligence, and a large number of Kurdish and Iraqi agents. The team, which is known as the Iraqi National Accord, as a front organization, and was led by Dr. Liad Alawi, a former member of Iraq's ruling Ba'ath Party. The operation, codenamed the Silver Bullet Coup, was to be carried out at a time when Baghdad was vulnerable as a result of weak relationships within Saddam's regime. However, things began to go south quickly before the mission could even begin. Dr. Alawi began to openly admit to the media that he wanted a coup to oust Hussein. Behind the scenes, things were even worse. It was realized that a large number of the CIA's recruits were double agents, and that Hussein knew of their plans. So the coup failed before it could even begin. Hussein arrested around 160 military officers and conspirators, many of whom were executed. Q number 3. After becoming president of Kenya in 1978, Daniel Arap Moy promised to be an actually decent leader. He gained the people's trust by bringing down those in high-ranking positions who were involved in corrupt activities. But behind closed doors, however, Moy was a man who fiercely guarded his leadership, quickly outmaneuvering and thwarting any political opposition that came against him during the early years of his presidency. He moved to centralize the government, making Kenya a one-party state where political opposition became illegal and the police were used to stamp out dissent. It wasn't until August 1982 that Moy would come up against his, as well as Kenya's, first attempted coup d'etat since it gained independence. At 2am on August 1st, a group of Kenyan Air Force officers made their move against the president. The men seized the international airport, the post office, and then the all-important radio station. Over the airwaves, they proclaimed the formation of the People's Redemption Council, while troops marched through the streets of Nairobi encouraging the people to rebel. But instead, people kinda just watched and went, meh. Interestingly, the rebellious troops, many of whom were drunk and looting, made no attempt to capture the president, and they garnered little to no support from the remaining Air Force troops. The fighter jets that were supposed to be used in the botched attempt were sabotaged by troops loyal to the president. Furthermore, they also had issues broadcasting their messages on the radio. After intense fighting in the city, the radio station was recaptured by the government. Moy returned to the city, and the rebels mm. were defeated. And unfortunately, this insurrection caused a ripple effect that saw civilians stealing cars, raping women, and looting. After the dust settled, the unofficial estimated death toll was between 600 to 1800 people. Special thanks to patrons Skylar Weston, Ben Hughes, Zy Mandes, and Hilly Pack.